الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين بينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives his fiqh of his religion and that he teaches his ta'wil of his book Likewise we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes his firm upon Islam until we meet him uh, This is the third to last session when we are looking at uh, this book, Fiqh al by uh, Muhammad bin Sari Thaymeen, Rahimahullah, the chapter of fasting. And inshallah, today we're going to be looking at what he has to say when it comes to the adab of siyam, the etiquettes that the person must have whilst he is fasting. On Saturday, inshallah, we'll be looking at some of the rulings concerning at taraweeh at-tahajjud, al-itikaf, and the final session, Saturday after that, some of the ahkam concerning zakat al-fitr and the day of Eid. Uh, before we start looking at some of uh, the questions that was asked to the Sheikh, it's important for us to uh, highlight something which is very, uh, something which everybody seems to be asking about actually tonight. When does the last 10 begin? Today is the 20th night. So you would think that the 10th begins tonight. The majority of the ulama have said that the last 10 nights begin on the 21st night before Maghrib. And this is when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to enter into itikaf. So the 20th night is not from the last 10. Some of the ulama have said, and this is based on the narration that has come to us in Bukhari and Muslim from Aisha radiallahu anha that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu used to begin his i'tikaf after Salatul Fajr on the 21st so that would make it even later but the answer that the majority of the ulama have given is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa used to begin the i'tikaf on the 21st and he used to worship all night and he used to rest from Fajr on the 21st and that's the way we can reconcile everything so before we start I thought it's important for us to highlight that that tonight is the 20th inshallah the last 10 begins tomorrow which is the 21st Adab al Siyam now when we're talking about etiquettes quite often people look at etiquettes as manners the way you are the way you behave the way you treat one another and this is fine and this is correct Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the best of mankind إِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَذِيمٍ You are on an exemplary form of manners Some of the ulama have said that this ayah and this description has not been given about anyone ever except for the Nabi of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam No Nabi that has come before has been praised in this manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised him with إِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَذِيمٍ Your manners are absolutely outstanding No fault in it Not the way you look Not the way you <coughs> express yourself Not in your body language Not the things that you say Not the way that you say them Nothing wrong with you Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam This is akhlaq This is etiquette This is manners this is what we have to follow him in Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam However Ibn Abbas anhuma, He said Innaka la khulufin adheem Meaning Ala deenin adheem Khuluq Has been used Ibn Abbas anhuma, Is saying here Is synonymous with the word Deen Meaning your religion So if we reinterpret you are upon an exemplary form of religion, not just akhlaq. Now this is the point that I want to make before we look at what the Shaykh has to say when it comes to some of the adab and the etiquettes. Quite often people think adab <coughs> got to do with smiling, looking nice, smelling nice, not you know, harming other people. And this is fine, this is part of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises his Nabi for. However, Part of adab is to know what is halal and what is haram. Part of adab is to know what is commanded of you and what is haram. And what is makroh. Part of adab is for you to learn your religion. 
Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Khayrukum fil jahiliyya Khayrukum fil islam But then he put a condition The best of you in jahiliyya Will be the best of you in islam What's the condition? Ida fuquhu If they have fiqh of the religion Therefore there are many Ayat or hadith we could talk about At length talking about the importance of ilm and this is what we are trying to say here. When the Shaykh is talking about adab, he's talking about adab, which is talking about your manners, the way you are whilst you are fasting, and this is fine. And you will find this in his first answer, actually, that he splits his answer because the question is asking him, Ma hiya adab as siyam? What are the etiquettes? What should I be doing whilst I am fasting? And you will see here, he splits it into what is spiritual, what is expected of you in your manners. And also from the adab, things that you should be doing and should not be doing and what is recommended for you to do and what is disliked. So he answers, from the adab, luzum taqwa For you to attain a consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that whilst you are fasting, you are thinking about the actions and the statements and even the thoughts that you are going through and you're experiencing whilst you are fasting is it beloved to Allah or is it not? لُزُومُ التَّقْوَىٰ بِفِئْلِ مُعَمِرِهِ وَشْتِنَابِ النَّوَاهِ Doing what he has told you to do is this what Allah likes for me to do or not? This is how the fasting person should be thinking or is this something that I'm doing on my phone or whilst I'm talking to someone or if I'm walking down the street is this something that is not beloved to Allah whilst I'm fasting and if a person is in that kind of a framework mindset then this is what the Shaykh is saying here is the primary goal for the person who is fasting why? because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ fasting has been prescribed for you so that you attain this etiquette and this manner also, we have a hadith on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bukhari, Man lam yada'akawn al-zur, whoever does not leave false speech wal amilu bihi, and acting upon that false speech wal jahl, any form of ignorance, فَلَيْثَ لِلَّهِ هَاجَ فِي أَنْ يَدَ طَعَامُ وَشِرَّةً Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is not in need for this person to starve himself food and drink. What's the point? He hasn't got the purpose as to what fasting was for prescribed for, so what's the point of him not eating and drinking? Then the Shaykh goes on to talking about, like we said, this is the spiritual aspect. Then he goes on to talking about those things that the person should be doing when it comes to wajib and recommended. And only a person can do that if they have ill. So he says, fulfill the wajibat and then increase in what is bir, in goodness and ihsan, to the creation Anything which is going to benefit people This is from the adab of the person who is fasting Because the messenger of Allah has been described As ajwad al-nas He was the most generous of people And he was more generous than he ever was Whilst he was in Ramadan Also from the adab then he goes on to say Rahimahullah Is that the person then must abstain from that which is haram Lying, insulting, swearing, deceiving, being treacherous, looking at what is haram, listening to what is haram. And these are just examples. And the Shaykh is saying here, outside of the fasting month, outside the fasting time period for that person who is fasting, whether it's Ramadan outside, the Muslim should be abstaining from that anyway. However, for the person who is fasting, it is even more emphasized that he pays attention to what is beloved to Allah and what brings about the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this we can then learn that Ramadan and fasting is a school. And when you graduate from it, inshallah, you graduate as better Muslims. And if every single one of us did that, what would happen to the ummah? This is the purpose of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not legislated us Ramadan just so that you can become pious for a month and then switch off afterwards. From the adab of Siyam is that the person makes suhoor. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to Sahruf in the Fisuhuri Barakah, have suhoor because in suhoor there is barakah. 
also from the adab of siyam is that the person must hasten to break his fast the messenger of Allah وسلم, said people will remain upon good there will be goodness in this ummah it will remain as long as they hasten to break their fast at its earliest time and he spoke the truth because of a person might think, okay, well, that's good, I'm going to be hasten to break my fast, but how is that a sign of goodness? The people of the book before us, they extended the fasting period. So if you look at the people who have recently just fasted the Lent, and then you have others from the people of the book who fast also, they changed the breaking of the period of time, which is Maghrib, to later on. So some of the Christians... They do what is similar to what we have as Risal, is they fast throughout the night until the next day. And some of the people of the book break their fast, not when the sun sets, but when it becomes dark. Hence, now the Messenger of Allah can understand and appreciate why he says, La yazal nas bi khair. You will remain upon goodness. You will remain upon the Sirat al Mustaqim as long as you break the fast in the manner that the Nabi وسلم, broke his fast. And don't think that this is far away. It is not far away. There are people from within the Muslim Ummah who say that you should delay the iftar by a few moments to be on the safe side. From the Adab, he is saying. Break your fast, hasten to break your fast. As long as you know now uh, Maghrib has entered, break your fast. How do you break your fast? With fresh dates. And if you ha don't have fresh dates, then any form of dates. And if you don't, then some with some water, the Shaykh is saying. Next question from the Adab Is it permissible? Now, this is a very frequently asked question, actually. Uh, and the Shaykh is going to answer it for us. For the Ilustri Shaykh. ما حكم أكل والشرب شك في طلوع الفجر من شك في طلوع الفجر Is it permissible for me to eat and drink whilst I am not sure that Fajr has begun yet? On my timetable it says 4.10, 4.9, 4.8 nine, and I've got some drink, I need to drink it or I need to take some medication or whatever it might be I look outside, it's still dark Am I allowed to finish this little bit? Or is my fast completely invalidated if I was to have that little bit? The Shaykh is saying here, there are two scenarios. Number one, if you know that the timetable has been verified and they are saying that this is accurate to the second, that if it says 4.11, then it is 4.11, then you are not allowed to go beyond that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Until it becomes clear If it is clear to you that Fajr has begun And the person has told you Fajr has begun Even if you can't see it Fajr has begun But the Shaykh is saying here If you are not certain And this is the case with so many different timetables in our city and even the timetables that the masajid that are following, they can't guarantee to say that we have 100% observation accuracy surrounding it. Then the Shaykh is saying here, a minute or two here and there doesn't harm. However, it is better for a person to refrain and don't go beyond. But if there is a need, then inshallah there is no harm as long as they haven't gone way beyond. A minute or two, there's no harm inshallah. Right, next question. Is it permissible for a person to... Now there's a couple of questions, so I'm just going to combine them. To use medications such as eye drops and ear drops, nose drops, whilst he is fasting. Uh, and included in this as well, is it permissible for a person to have a bath whilst he is fasting? These are from the adab the sheikh is putting down. Meaning, during your day, you're going about doing your thing, your normal routine. It's from the Adab. Right. The Sheikh is saying here, and this is the principle, as long as nothing reaches your throat from either your mouth or your nose, then that thing does not break your fast. So if you put eardrops in, 
it's not going to break your fast. Even if it reaches your throat, because it didn't come through your mouth or your nose. Eye drops. Even if it reaches your throat, and he gives the example of Ibn Taymiyyah, and people put kuhl. People who put kuhl, ithmid, it reaches their throat sometimes. But because it's come through the eyes, and it's not from the mouth and the nose, it doesn't break the fast. Same thing when it comes to swimming. This is what he's been asked here. Same thing when it comes to showers. Same thing when it comes to baths. The Shaykh is saying here, none of this breaks the fast as long as it doesn't reach the throat from the mouth and the nose. What about brushing your teeth for the Ilat al-Shaykh? The Shaykh is saying here, toothpaste is not food and it's not drink. Therefore, it's permissible for a person to use it. However, the Shaykh is saying here, it is better if the person doesn't brush his teeth using toothpaste during the day because there could be remnants that gets absorbed into the saliva and then he swallows it and then that could then break the fast. However, if a person needs to brush his teeth, sensitive teeth, I don't know, they've got things in their, in their teeth, uh, could be smell, it could be anything, then the Sheikh is saying here, and then there is nothing to prohibit it. You just have to be careful that you don't swallow anything. Why? Because it is not food and drink. And because it is not food and drink, it is permissible for you to brush your teeth, inshallah. Next couple of questions are concerning perfume. Again, we are talking about adab, your routine. So you've got dressed, you've brushed your teeth, you've had a shower. Sheikh has said this is fine. Maybe you need to take some medication, some eye drops, whatever it might be. Now you're ready. Can I put some perfume on? The Sheikh is saying here, perfume, whether it's the liquid form or it's the bukhur form, the incense that, you know, certain cultures have. The Sheikh is saying here, none of this invalidates the fast. Shimutib, la batsabihi sawakana duhn and bukhura. Smelling perfume, whether that's in the smoke form or whether that's in the spray form or whether that's in the oil form, all of this is permissible. And smelling it doesn't invalidate the fast. However, the Sheikh is saying here, if it is smoke, then the person should not allow, such as diffusers and incense, the person should not allow that smoke to enter into his body. Because smoke is a form, especially when it's the diffusers, has water particles in it. And if you allow that to enter into your body, it would nullify. But in its asal, in its origin, the Sheikh is saying here, it is permissible for a person uh, to apply perfume shower gel, shampoo, whatever it might be, all of this is permissible once the person is fasting and it doesn't contradict the etiquettes of the fasting person. Next two questions, I'll combine them again. If a person eats or drinks accidentally whilst he is fasting, what should that person do? And if you see someone eating and drinking accidentally, what should you do? Now this is answered in the hadith on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Anyone who forgets and he eats and he drinks whilst he is fasting The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said carry on fasting Because this has been given to him as a gift from Allah Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who has given him this food and drink Very important principle and we talked about this previously as well. If a person does something out of mistake, ignorance or force or forgetfulness, that person is not accountable for halal or haram. So if you eat during the day in Ramadan, this is a major sin. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, when he ascended, he saw people being punished and he said, Jibreel, what's this? These people are being punished in such a terrible manner. Jibreel informs him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these people broke their fast during the day in Ramadan without any excuse. May Allah protect us. It's a major sin. So then how can we say in this hadith, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is saying here, carry on fasting, don't worry. Allah is the one that fed you. Allah is the one that gave you drink. This is the principle. And this applies to Ramadan. This applies to outside Ramadan. This applies to fiqh in general. And this is what I was saying in the introduction is very important. 
But etiquette and adabs is not just about how we smile and how we treat one another. It's about learning the halal and the haram. And about learning the haram and the haram, there are principles. Anything you do out of forgetfulness, mistake, ignorance or duress, you are not accountable for these. And this is what the Shaykh is saying here. However, imagine a person <coughs> takes a bite of the food and he remembers the bite is in his mouth. What does he do? Carry on eating? These four things here that we've just talked about, forgetfulness, mistake, duress, and ignorance, once these are lifted, you are accountable immediately. So even if you've got the food morsel in your mouth, you remember at that moment, you must spit it out. And this is what the Shaykh is saying here. And it's very important that in this answer, Rahimahullah, he's given us principles, really loaded answer here, which we can take away and understand other aspects of the religion. Right. Second part of the question, what do we do if we see somebody else eating? The Shaykh is saying here, Ta'awun al birri wa taqwa. The person must cooperate with one another upon what is piety and what is taqwa. If you see someone who's doing something wrong, maybe he's got one of these four that we have just mentioned, especially when you realize that the person might be mistaken, might be in ignorance, you don't treat with that person in a, in a harsh manner. Hence the Shaykh is saying, ta'awun, cooperation, not blaming, not scorning, not chastising, ta'awun. Ta'awun basically means that you are working with your brother. You are working with your sister. You want to help complete that person. And likewise, you want them to complete you. So the Shaykh is saying here, if you see a person doing something wrong during the day in Ramadan, you remind them. <clears throat> Next question, uh, and this is about traveling. And the next few are about traveling. Okay, so the next couple of questions are about traveling. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we've got a couple of questions about making up misfasts, and then that's it. Traveling. If a person travels, now this is important because a person recently asked, <coughs> and this I think applies to some people here also, they work outside Leicester and they travel on a daily basis. I'm traveling every day. Can I break my fast? Can I shorten my prayers? Can I combine my prayers? The Sheikh is saying here, as long as the person is traveling, then he takes the concession of a traveler. It doesn't matter how frequently you travel, as long as you are a traveler, then you do not need to fast. But if you fasted, the Sheikh is saying here, then this is a great deal of goodness and there is no harm in it, as long as there is no difficulty involved. And the Shaykh gives an example from the Seerah, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when Mecca was liberated, this is towards the end of his life, وسلم, no one was fasting except himself, وسلم, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Everyone else from the companions, 10,000 army strong, none of them were fasting. And in actual fact, he found a group of people who were fasting out of difficulty. Now, here's an important point, and we're going to talk about this a bit more next week. And you can go away and check for yourselves, actually. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, fasted nine Ramadans. He was prescribed in the second after Hijrah, and he passed away <coughs> 11th after Hijrah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, into the 11th year. So the last Ramadan that he had was in the 10th. Nine Ramadans, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, and this is a historical fact anyway, all of them were in summer. Now, if you look at the prayer times in Al Madina in July, in June, those will be the same prayer times that the Messenger of Allah had in his Ramadan. Because summer in Medina is not going to change. It doesn't matter how many years you're going to go past, it's going to be more or less the same. Fajr begins around 4 o'clock, Maghrib begins around 7 o'clock. And Isha is about 9 o'clock. This is how the Messenger of Allah would have had 
his Ramadans. This is how he would have had his last 10 nights. Begins fasting at 4 o'clock. He breaks his fast at 7 o'clock according to our standard of timings. <coughs> and at 9 o'clock he used to pray Salat al-Isha and he used to stand until when? Until 4 o'clock in the morning. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Six or seven hours of standing. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, you can see that that is very impressive. You can see that that person, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had been given a level of servitude that no one, no one could replicate. And this is what we said earlier, innaka la'ala khuluqin adheem. You alone, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are on a level of khuluq, not only with the creation, but with Allah, nobody else has been said about before. The point, is that those fasting days would have been long. It would have been hot. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, found people fasting whilst they were traveling and they were going through a great deal of difficulty. So look what he says about the companions who are fasting in Ramadan alongside the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in Makkah. What did he say? Ula'ika usa. These are the sinners. These are the sinners. Companions in Mecca, in Ramadan, alongside the Messenger of Allah. Virtue after virtue after virtue after virtue. And they fasted. And he said, you did something wrong. You are the sinners. You guys have done something wrong. Therefore, the Shaykh is saying here. Also, we have another hadith, well-known hadith. Messenger of Allah said, ليس من السيام في السفر. It is not piety that a person fasts whilst he is traveling. Putting this all together, the questioner is asking, if a person is traveling, is he allowed to you know, take the concession of uh, breaking his fast? The answer is yes, the Shaykh is saying here. However, if the person finds it easy for him to fast, then he should do so and that person will get the reward for it and he won't need to make qada afterwards. Similar question was asked, if I am going for Umrah, should I fast or not fast? Same sort of answer, we don't need to repeat. Uh, last question about qada. If a person... Okay, there are three questions here about qada and they're all very different. And they're all very important and they all have different answers. Right. First one, if a person misses any days from Ramadan, what does he do? The Shaykh is saying here, if anyone misses any day in Ramadan for whatever reason, then they must make the qada. However, he highlights a very important point, which is his view, is that if a person doesn't make the qada before the next Ramadan, and he has no legitimate reason for delaying, then he has missed the time for qada. This is the view of the sheikh, not the view of the majority. The majority of the ulama have said it remains as a debt upon your head. But the reason, and we talked about this before, is that the sheikh is saying here, everything has a prescribed period for you to worship Allah in. Salat al-Fajr has a window for you which is roughly around two hours. If you were to say, no, I'll pray Fajr when I feel like it. The Shaykh is saying here, yeah, it doesn't matter if you pray Fajr when you feel like it, even a million times it will not be accepted. Why? <coughs> Everything has a prescribed time. And the Shaykh is saying the same thing here. If you have missed a day in Ramadan, for whatever reason, you have to make the Qada. Qada, hasten to do the Qada. If there is a reason for you to delay it, then you are allowed to because Aisha radiallahu anha used to do this and she used to make up her qada in Sha'ban. But you have to do it before the next Ramadan. Next question. If a person dies in Ramadan, what do we do about that person's uh, qada? Now this is important. The Shaykh is saying here, Imagine you've got a person, he fasted day one, two, three, four, five, and he dies on day six. Do you make qada for that person for the rest of Ramadan? The Shaykh is saying no, because he wasn't 
accountable for the rest of Ramadan. He did what he was supposed to do and he passed away before he could do the rest of it. <coughs> That's one scenario. Another scenario, a person doesn't fast the first day, second day, but then he passes away on the sixth. What do we do in that scenario? In that scenario now the Shaykh is saying here, you have one of two options. Either as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his heir must fast on their behalf. So if your father passes away and he owes one day in Ramadan, two days in Ramadan, you, the next of kin, would fast on their behalf. Or if you can't fast on their behalf, perhaps sometimes, okay, if it's one or two days, it's understandable, but sometimes a person might fast, sorry, a person might pass away and they leave behind loads of fasts. Wallahi, I know some women, for some reason, Allah knows best, they were told that when you are on your menses, you don't need to make qada. I don't know this from the Hanafi madhab or any other madhab. When they became elder, they've said for 15 years, for 20 years, we didn't make up any qada for menses. This is the importance of the introduction we said before. You are upon a deen which is adheem. Learn your deen. So now what do they do? They have to make qada for 15 years. 15 years times it by seven. If they fast seven, uh, sorry, if they have seven days on menses. How many fasts do they owe now? We're talking about hundreds. Some sisters, they owe hundreds of fasts. And this is just hey, Imagine there's nifas. Imagine there's other things. Right, now what do we do in that scenario? It's not easy, is it? Say this woman passes away and you're the next of kin and she owes a hundred fasts. What do we do in that scenario? Can you make a hundred fasts? So the Shaykh is saying here, the second option is that you feed on behalf of that person for every single day. You feed on behalf of that person every single day. Last question. Al-Farq, now this is a bit technical. If you have any kind of experience in Usul al-Fiqh, I think you might appreciate this. Fadilat al-Shaykh, هل هناك فوارق بين الأداء والقضاء في شهر رمضان؟ Is there a difference between Ada and قضاء in Ramadan? Basically, the person who is fasting in Ramadan, say he needs to make قضاء outside of Ramadan. Does he have the same rules apply to him outside of Ramadan that he used to have applied to him inside of Ramadan? For example, like we just said a moment ago, a person who breaks his fasts in Ramadan for no reason, major sin. But imagine you're making qada for a Ramadan fast outside of Ramadan, in Shawwal, okay, that whatever. And you broke that fast. Is that the same level of severity of, of sin or not? This is what the Shaykh is being asked here. That if a person is making ada, is that the same as qada or not? Very important question, technical question. And in this, like I said, with these technicalities and these principles, you can apply them elsewhere. The Shaykh is saying here, Rahimahullah, if a person finds himself in Ramadan and he is making ada and he is performing the fasts of Ramadan and he is observing Ramadan, he must preserve Ramadan and everything which is connected to Ramadan. But if a person finds himself fasting, even if it's a Ramadan fast, or even if it's a voluntary fast, it could be any kind of a fast outside of Ramadan, those rulings do not apply. So imagine if a person is fasting and he has relations with his wife in Ramadan, it's not the same inside Ramadan and outside Ramadan. Imagine if a person breaks his fast Inside Ramadan, the Shaykh is saying here, he has to abstain for the rest of the day. He's brought it on himself. Why did he break his fast? So he has to refrain for the rest of the day and he has to make qada. But if a person breaks his fast outside of Ramadan, no such thing. Make tawbah, make istighfar, because you broke an act of worship which was wajib upon you. You make qada, but that's it. These are some of the questions. I've summarized uh, what the Shaykh has said. There is a great deal of benefit that we have uh, you know, not taken from the answers that have been given by the Shaykh. But this is a summary of what the Shaykh has to say when it comes to the adab and the etiquettes of fasting. Inshallah, on Saturday after Dhuhr, not Asr, 
our normal session is after Asr al Dhuhr on Saturday. We're going to be looking at at Taraweeh, at Tahajjun and Itikaf, uh, and some of the ahkam surrounding that. And then, inshallah, the week after, some of the ahkam surrounding Zakat al Fitr and Eid. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes this Ramadan a goodness for us individually, and goodness for our households, and goodness for our community, and goodness for this Muslim Ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us Izzah and honor in our religion, and that He gives glory and support to the Muslim Ummah wherever they may be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He facilitates for the people who are being oppressed all around the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He alleviates the pressures and the disturbances that have been being witnessed in Masjid al-Aqsa. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He purifies Masjid al-Aqsa from the writs and the impurity that is being faced. The whole world is witnessing and anyone with an eye of justice, Muslim, non-Muslim, can see that there are people who just want to worship Allah but then they are calling them terrorists. Mm. Allah Mustaan. Mm. What greater oppression is this? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He removes oppression Amen. and that He gives us honour in our religion and that He allows us to get back to our religion Amen. and that He allows us to get closer to Him so that he will be pleased with us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We fear that you are not happy with us. We fear that you are not happy with us or that we are being oppressed. <laughs> oh Allah, be happy with us and allow us to get closer to you so that you will be pleased with us. So that we can establish your religion on this earth in a manner that you are pleased with us with. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to have mercy on us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalala la ilaha ilaha nistaghfiru wa atum bayu Allahu alam sallallahumma ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi 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 wa sah